Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to listen in on conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today, I have the great pleasure and honor of uh, speaking with an old friend. Well, I mean, he's not old. It's just, it's about the, the time frame, right? And someone who's been busy living in the pits, of Broadway <laughs> and 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 more. But before I, I get on with this, I want to thank you, Larry Lelly. Thank you so much for joining me today on this. My pleasure, Aldo. It's great to be here. Before we get into the conversation of uh, shaping your journey, and it's it's always a, an, an interesting journey, whoever we speak to or we think about. Um, I mean, you're you're in New York right now, but. Um, just say a few a few words about where did it start for you? Where was that spark? Where, where, where was that initial fire for you started to be in this? Oh, it was my earliest memories. That's such a fun question to think about. I was born just outside of Chicago. And when I was very, very little there, I mean, like probably three or four years old, I have memories of dragging out all my mom's pots and pans out of the kitchen like you know kids do i don't know where it came from i i have no real recollection of like what made me want to do that or how i decided to do that but at some point i had a little toy drum that i could strap on and march around with and i have a picture of that and i don't remember it but i have a picture of that so i've always been pulled toward the drums and it wasn't until much later i mean that 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 desire was always there and i was always kind of bothering my parents hey i want some drums i want a drum set i want a drum or whatever and they finally broke down when i was about 12 and got me a drum set and i just sat down and instantly kind of knew how to do it so hmm. i don't know where that where that spark came from that way it's, it's always just been my earliest memories well, that that's always interesting to to, to understand why, because I I had kind of a same experience. I mean, I played, but only when I was a professional tour in the world did I see my father. I think I was in my thirties by then, and I had you know I'd been around a little bit, you know, around the world with repercussion, my own yeah. my own work, studio work, and everything. And suddenly, I see my father. I went to visit my father. And he started playing tamborello. Yes, I'm, I'm, I was born in, in Calabria, so uh, we have, uh, you know, we're Calabrese. And he started playing this traditional drum that I had been going to New York, studying with Glenn Velez, going yeah. to L.A., going to, like, every place on the planet I could to study everything. Yeah. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you're playing <laughs> things that those people, as great as they are, can't play, and you never told me. He says, this is the strangest, the strangest thing. So... Sometimes you never know where, where these things come from. Genetic or something, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Wow. So, I, I mean, you're outside Chicago. Is that uh, in Wisconsin somewhere, right? Well, eventually I ended up in Wisconsin, yeah. But but where I was born was an actual suburb of Chicago. Okay. And then I, did, I bounced around. Uh, you know, my family bounced around Wisconsin quite a bit. And I ended up going to middle school and high school and then ultimately college there. In in uh, you know I, I I know Wisconsin a little bit because that was my first drum camp. Oh, was in, it in, in Madison? Did you Lake, Madison, Wisconsin, Madison. at the university. Oh. It was a, a Lid, Lidrick Percussion Symposium. Oh, cool! Is that still around? No, that was. Yeah, I yeah. think they stopped that years ago. But that was the greatest. Uh, uh, I mean, it's certainly what it inspired me. It it you know it, it inspired me in many ways because it was there that I learned that studying with all the great teachers is the way to go. <laughs> you know, I was a, a rock drummer. I really yeah. didn't, you know, didn't know anything except, you know, just played and it was it seemed natural. It was fun. And that's what you did. But then I realized yeah. there were people making a living at this. You had to yeah. read, you had to know your stuff. You had to be solid. And I, then I said, that's what I want to do, be a studio musician. And then I, I went to this camp and I mean, Gary Burton was my first vibraphone teacher, imagine. I uh, yeah. actually yeah, told, yeah. showed me how to hold four mallets. And yeah, yeah. Joe Morello, Carmine Apice, uh, yeah. 
uh, Christian, uh, Bobby Christian, I remember. My God. Bobby Christian Long. Yeah, Lee right. Stevens was there. I mean, everybody who was anybody was at, at that camp teaching. So it, you know, when I came back, of course, then I, I became like rocketized, I, for yeah. lack of a better word. And then, of course, that was my inspiration for starting the whole COSA thing, the camps, because I said, everybody needs to study with the best. And then we created that, the best environment we could. So that was the yeah. whole idea behind that. Such a beautiful thing. And you know, it's it's funny that you were in the Midwest as well. There's such a important focus on music education there still. Still? And I was going to ask you that. Still is uh, the same? One of the last places in the country where they still put a huge focus on music and the arts. When, mm -hmm. you know, kids are in high school, middle school and high school. And there are music camps all over that state that happened in the summer. Uh, the one that I went to myself was Shell Lake, the one I asked you about, in Shell Lake, Wisconsin, a little okay. bitty town, uh, maybe an hour north of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where okay. I went to college. And it was the same thing. Like, Bobby Christian was there. They would um, – there were a lot of guys that taught in Indiana University would come up there for the summer and teach. So the faculty was incredible there. And that's where I got fired up about playing, too, and I realized, oh, you – you can't, I mean, you can just teach yourself everything and get along and play in rock bands or whatever. But if you really want to be a pro, this that's where I learned that kind of stuff. Reading, arranging, we did everything there. Sight singing, you know, and then you play in all these different ensembles. It was fantastic experience. Oh, I'm so, so glad to hear that we have that in common. That's fun. Nice. And and then from there, I mean, you moved on to, to uh, Nashville? Yeah, well, or, first I went to Minneapolis because oh. that was the closest big city. As soon as I got out of college, I went to Minneapolis. Um, I started playing in the Cedar Avenue big band. I was very, very lucky there. And I had a few really great drummers kind of take me under their wing in Minneapolis. Um, it was a guy named uh, Joe Police, who was there at the time, Gordy Knutson, and um, Phil Hay were like the cats in, okay. in the scene in Minneapolis. And they would start throwing me gigs things like that. Um, I only stayed there about, I'm going to say three years after college, because I realized I kind of had topped out the music scene already. And I felt like I wanted to play on a more national level. I wanted to tour with big artists and that kind of stuff. Right. And so then after that, I moved to Nashville and stayed there for a few years and toured with country artists, which was a blast. Nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Nashville is a is a super music music town. Oh, um, it's all of there, yeah, yeah. And then, how did you end up on the Broadway scene in New York? It was kind of a fluke. It wasn't really a planned thing with my career or anything. Um, the guy that I was touring with in Nashville at the time, his name was Doug Stone. He was a big platinum selling country artist, and he had to take some time off from touring right in the middle of touring season. And so I was kind of, I wouldn't say I was laid off, but he had some health issues. So we, we had to stop touring for a while. That's what happened, went down. He's okay now. But anyway, so I'm sitting around with nothing to do. I thought I had this whole touring season booked and I'm just kind of like, well, what should I do? And nobody really knew me in town because the Nashville clicks are very separate. Like there's the road click, the touring cats, and the session cats. And then there's a whole other scene that's like a Christian music scene. And there's a, a scene of, of demo recording musicians who just record song demos all day, all day. And so I was talking to a friend of mine and, and just kind of saying, I don't know what, what I should do. I've got all this free time. And he said, why don't you come up and visit New York? You know, we're always going up here, you know, and I've got some friends who play on Broadway. They love it. And you know, because I was also talking about it's hard to be on the road all the time and be away from your family and stuff like that. And so it just kind of happened out of a conversation. So I just booked a ticket to New York for a weekend just to go visit on a whim. And this friend of mine introduced me to a couple of drummers who were playing Broadway shows. And I called them up. I said, hey, I'm in town for a few days. You know, I'm just trying to check out the scene. And they were so welcoming, These the drummers that I met were like, hey, yeah, I'm playing the show to, tonight. Why don't you come down and sit in the pit with me? Just you know, get some black clothes and come down and sit. You can sit next to me and see what it's like. 
And that's really how it happened. And I showed up and I was blown away. I was like, this is incredible. This is exciting. There's this huge orchestra playing. There's this giant show going on up above us. The, the musicianship, the quality of the musicianship was out of this world. I mean, just incredible players. Yeah, yeah. And I was so excited about it. And I had nothing to do because I had <laughs> all this free time. And so really on a whim, I just decided I'm going to get a place. I'm going to get an apartment and come up here and hang out for a couple months and see see what happens. It's it's literally how it happened. Yeah. What a, so yeah. a sublet apartment, which was really hard to do in New York. and moved up there with my drums and some clothes and nothing else and just started meeting people yeah. for three months. I said, I'm going to hang here for three months, see what happens. So I just, every night I'd go out, I either sit in a Broadway show pit or I'd go to an open jam session, or I'd go and hear some of my great, you know, heroes were playing still in the village at a jazz club or something, you know, went to the village Vanguard every, I just was like hanging, hanging, hanging and meeting people. And that's really how it all started. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I just for you to know, Larry, I, I don't believe in coincidences. Things happen for a reason. And then you either yeah. say yes or no. I mean, the, they're always that fork in the road or that door that, you know, you open it or not, you know, that kind of thing. So that's that's perfect. Oh, exactly how it happens. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, when I came to New York, you uh, you invited me to to the pit. You yeah. know, and I and I've done a lot of Broadway shows myself. I mean, I've done a lot of different things, and and that's exciting. You know, working in that environment, but um, it, it's interesting to. I mean, where wherever one wants to go, it's kind of you're pulled in that direction. Somebody's telling you, "This is what you got to do," and you yeah. you listen or you don't. If you listen, yeah. this is what happens. You, you show up, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of what it was for me. You know, there was always this idea of New York in my head since I was a little kid. I always had this fantasy of it from movies and TV or whatever. I didn't really understand the scene at all as a musician until I went there and visited. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is massive. You know, I didn't realize the enormity of it and how deep and heavy it is. I mean, the best musicians in the world are living there playing, you know, back then it was, they were playing film sessions all day or recording sessions, you know, it was the place to be. And I, so I always had this, this kind of pull to go there. And so when my friend said, why don't you do this? I was like, yeah, why don't I? Yeah, let's do that. So I totally agree with you about the, the door opening and you either walk through it or you don't, you know, exactly. exactly. The best thing I ever did move into New York. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been, you've been doing the, those Broadway shows for, for many years, right? How many yeah. years? It's uh, 25 years. I'm up on 25 years now, yeah. Wow, yeah. That, that was like yesterday, right? <laughs> I know. I know. That's kind of how it feels because Broadway is, I don't want to say relentless, but it's just ever going. It's ongoing all the time, 365 days a year. You know, the eight shows a week, 52 weeks out of the year. It's always going. There's always shows running. Wow. And yeah. so especially I've, I've been so fortunate to be so busy and to go almost from show to show to show. I've been very, very lucky that way. But even when I've been between full time shows, this, there's this whole subbing scene where you can sub, you know, for all the open shows that are running. And so in between shows, I would always call up you know, whoever's playing whatever show and say, hey, I'm available again. And luckily they would say, yeah, come on in. I, I need you to cover me because I'm going to go do this tour or I'm going to, I want to take off every other day or, you know, whatever. We have a great contract on Broadway where you're allowed to leave your gig and go do other gigs so other people can come in and sub for you. Yeah. So the, the work is always there. It's yeah. just a matter of you getting into that scene and understanding the skills and you know that you need that are required for that scene because it's not like anything else in the world. Yeah, it's and of course you're like you're prepared. I mean, session. one has to be prepared for that for that kind exactly. of work, right? Exactly. And I mean, you can't just say, "Well, I'm a I'm a jazz drummer, so I'm going to go do Broadway," yeah. or "I'm a classical percussionist." I and just you have exactly. to understand, yeah. 
And that's that's a, that's a great thing. I I remember once I did a lot of shows, uh, Broadway shows, and one actually that I was so fortunate to do was was a, actually a, a premiere. So I was I was in the original orchestrations, the choosing wow. of instruments, and that's that's when that happens. That's that's huge. Oh yeah. And it was uh, it was a show that started actually in Montreal with the intention that they would move it to New York. So pe- all these Broadway people would come up and see it. And it sure. was uh, uh, Jean Lapoussel, uh, Joan of Arc. Okay. The original Joan of Arc. And they did it here with some, you know, super well-known singers and all of that stuff. And it was uh, an amazing show. And they and they used to do it. It was funny because they used to do it one week in English, one week in French. So there was like two shows. Oh. <laughs> it was... With the same cast? Same cast. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That- so... It was it was really funny. Funny in in the sense that you had to say, okay, which one is it today? So you had to get used to, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was really nice because, uh, you know, yeah. you'd play and then the orchestrator would come over and say, well, how about if we did that on this instrument? You yeah. know that whole thing, and I'd say, well, that doesn't really work, and I'll show you why. I say, you're right, but how, so how about if we do this? And you know, so that whole creative yeah. process. Isn't Beautiful. it wonderful? Yeah. I love that you got a chance to do that because it's a really unique thing that a lot of musicians don't ever get that opportunity. But it's really like cre- you're creating something in this massively collaborative way because right. the parts that you're playing and that you're writing in that moment are affecting, you know, they're affecting the orchestration overall, but it's giving something that the musical director needs or that the dancers need or that the singers need. Yeah. It's such a wonderful thing. And unique experience. I'm so glad you got to do that, Aldo. Yeah, That's yeah, no, it's, it's it's nice, and I can just imagine in New York, and you're doing that all the time. Oh man, wow, all that's time. incredible. Yeah, you know, it doesn't happen just when you're doing a show that's going to Broadway or it's opening on Broadway. There are constantly what we call readings and workshops of new shows. Okay, that are at somewhere along their development process. And so there might be a a three day reading or a one week reading or a six week workshop, you know, depending how much money they have and where they are in their development. So I've been also lucky enough to be invited to create a lot of these shows when they're just starting that it just might be a composer in the room with you working out what the songs are going to sound like. Before they pitch it to an investor to get some seed money, they call it, to then develop the show. So I could, you know, especially when I was playing the producers, I did that show for so long. I would love to take off and do other things. I can't even count the number of shows that I developed during that time while I was playing the producers at night. But all day, every day, I was working on some other show at some other point in its development process. Nice. It's It's an entirely thrilling community to be a part of it's so creative and there's so much going on i just i feel so lucky to be a part of it really I've yeah. Been very- yeah and that i mean that that's the thing that we forget about and now that you mention it of course uh somebody has is in a development of some kind of show one of a show they have an idea so they were just you have the even the orchestra right there if they have the the budget and the time they say well can we run it with the orchestra right yeah, i mean absolutely. that's you know, that reminds me, I, I used to play in a TV orchestra. We were uh, 19 musicians, and we would do a regular national TV show, and we used to rehearse in a recording studio. Yeah. Uh, once a week rehearsal, and then, you know, uh, writers and, and uh, film people would, would get a hold of that and say, hey, listen, I don't have, we don't have to go and ha- hire anybody. Just call the contractor, say, call them. <laughs> yeah. And then book extra time with them. They're already in the studio. They're rehearsing the, the songs for the TV show. Yeah. And uh, did a lot of films like that, did a lot of commercials where That's it'd good. say, okay, break. We don't need uh, the strings in this one. We don't need the horns in this one. We don't need this. So we would just do the do that one hour session <laughs> just for these folks, whether it's a commercial or a, or just a, an ad or something. And it was, it was fun. So I, I can just imagine... In, in New York, I, I, I'm just thinking, of course, <laughs> of course, they could, they could just do that. Say the orchestra's right there. They're used to working together. 
They're used to the way of working. They can save time. They're already set up. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. You know what? That reminds me of a story of, this was decades ago now, but Frank Wildhorn, who is a, a prolific Broadway composer, um, I was playing his show uh, called Jekyll and Hyde back then. This is really like 20, over 20 years ago. And he was writing so many shows. There was a time when he had four shows open on Broadway at the same time. And he would call us or we'd get a text or whatever. No, they weren't. This was before text. How would we get a message? I think we'd get a message at the stage door. Like they'd call the doorman during the show, leave a message with the doorman and say, hey, I need piano, bass, drums and guitar and a violin to come and play the session after the show. And so we'd be playing the show. We'd get this message and we'd all say, I have to get a message back to him. Yeah, we'll come and do it. And so we'd finish the show at 11 o'clock run over to the st recording studio and do a session at midnight for another show that he was writing. I mean, he's such a prolific writer. Wow. So it was, it, it's the best, man. We're yeah. so lucky to do this. <laughs> it's so fun, right? I mean, yeah. I just, you know I what? really, I thank the stars every day that I get to do this for a living. It's so wonderful. Yeah. Well, luck, luck is, you know, preparation and being there and, and, and making those choices and just, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but I mean, I mean, we're so fortunate to do this and, and I mean, just having, having that smile on your face all the time, just saying, I'm uh, going to work. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel obnoxious almost sometimes. I get so much joy from getting to do what I love to do. Yeah. And you also, I mean, you also recorded with artists like uh, Melissa Etheridge. Um, did I read Mamas and Papas a long time sure. ago? Yep. Nice. That was, a thrill. that was a big thrill. Do you remember which uh, Mamas and Papas tune, maybe? The tunes? Well, yeah, Monday, Monday. I was Monday a big was fan of really... Mamas and Papas, by the way. So I Mamas and the Papas. Yeah, Monday, Monday was one of the probably the one of their biggest hits. Yeah, um yeah, yeah. boy, we did all sorts of stuff. We did a version of Dancing in the Streets with them. Yes, I remember that. That was a beautiful yeah. tune that that uh, Mick Jagger uh, took after. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Scott Phillips would come out and tour with us sometimes too. And so we'd do his hits. He had a really big hit. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember what? Um, what? What was his big hit? Scott Phillips. Yeah. Oh, Scott McKenzie. I'm sorry. Um, Scott McKenzie, McKenzie. Okay. Scott McKenzie. Yeah, I, I misspoke. Uh, San Francisco. Oh yes. Okay. And and from that, I mean, you're. This is the same time that you're doing the 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 uh, Broadway shows. You're also yes. doing. Um, all these sessions and touring with them because you can come back and you can get subbed exactly. and all of that. Beautiful. Yeah. It's the greatest kind of life. I'm so lucky that I felt kind of fell into. And now you're doing, um, this other show that, uh, I'm hearing about that you're producing or you're in the production. Now it's in, it's getting ready and it's, it's being launched this year. Yeah. Sorry. I think I cut out there on you for a minute. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this new show is based on the book water for elephants. And the show it's coming together beautifully. I'm really excited about it. Nice. Nice. That, that's fantastic. I mean, also being an entrepreneur in our field, that's it's also a it's yeah, very I mean, much we, we progress, right? I mean, we progress to other steps of our lives that we yeah. include other parts of what we do. Yeah. Well, I ended up loving Broadway so much. And I love the creation of musical theater. And I love putting a show on and having 2,000 people come and see it and have this moving experience. It's just become such a love of my life, the whole theater industry. And I just immersed myself into it. And so it only was a natural progression for me because I've been sitting in the corner of the room creating these musicals from day one for so many shows anyway. So I've been a part of that process. It's just a natural kind of evolution for me to start to work on the other side of the table, as we call it. 
Sure, sure. It makes sense. It makes sense. And and all the experience you have, I mean, that's only more that you can bring to the table. And that's just that just makes sense. And it's also opinions, I'll say that. Well, sorry, <laughs> said that again. Twenty five years of observing things as they are being built, and they either go really, really well or they go really, really poorly. You know, and you learn from watching that happen over and over in the hundreds of shows that I've been a part of developing and you see which ones succeed and you start to put together, Oh, this is why that one worked. And this is why that one didn't. So I, you know, I, I feel like I do, I can bring a lot of that experience. You know, I, I just think I'm really opinionated, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for good reason. I mean, it, it doesn't kind of come out of thin air there. Um, uh, I mean, these things, you know, you know, when you can bring things to the table and you should, you know, because sometimes we have all of this experience in things and why shouldn't yeah. you just bring that forth or, or take advantage of, of that situation that what you've created, basically it's yours. And it would yeah. be a shame not to in my book. Yeah. Well, I'm very fortunate that other people care what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Oh, That's yeah. a good thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm surrounded with other very wonderful and brilliant people every day, so it's a, it's a it's just a great atmosphere to be in. You know, we all want each other to thrive and to succeed. It's a very supportive community, Broadway overall. And right, I, right. I, I don't know necessarily how other communities are as far as that goes, but Broadway has really surprised me that way, and how collaborative and open and supportive it is for everybody. Yeah. It's Probably, a wonderful I mean, I think uh, different communities have their support system in a different way, but because in a, in a situation like Broadway, you see each other all the time, every day. And it's, and it's like, it seems to be the same thing every day, but it's not, but the right. people are the same people showing up in a different situation and they have to make exactly. it work. So this whole, I think this whole psychology works that it's, it's like that, that collective that you have to make sure, uh, again, that if, if everybody's okay, then you're okay. If yeah. somebody's not okay, then something's not going to work. Right. Exactly. So I think, I think that that plays on everybody and as musicians and our, as artists, we're, generally sensitive to those kinds of things. But I think the Broadway situation, because it's so, it's like a bubble, even, yeah. even though it's not just one show, but the whole, the big picture, yeah. I think it goes bigger because everybody's got to be okay because ev everything is so interdependent. Exactly. That's, that's what I would think. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We all have to show up and bring our best every day because each little, you know, part of that chain is so integral to the whole thing holding together. If one thing is out of you know line, it's off balance suddenly. Yeah. yeah. I think I think you make a really good point there about why everybody shows up and brings their best and really tries to support everybody else in yeah. that whole community. Oh no no, and I've, I've, I I can say that because I've experienced. I mean, I've done many different things, but the Broadway type uh, mentality, I I I felt I've experienced it, and and I even worked with uh, once there was one show from from New York, uh, the Fiddler on the, on the Roof production with wow. Fivish Finkel, Anton Coppola was the conductor, wow. <laughs> so I worked with him for two months. And, uh, and 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 I, you see that, and everybody is watching out for everybody, not just amongst the musicians, but musicians right. and the actors. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I remember it was funny because when I was uh, hired to do this show, it was my percussion teacher who said, "I can't do this, so yeah. I'm giving it to you. you. It's a two month thing." And so when I showed up, it was in Vancouver when they started. It was a Canadian tour. Yeah. In Vancouver, when they started the show, and there's these extra rehearsals, and I said, "Well, it's that's nice that they have these extra rehearsals." So when I arrived before everyone, <laughs> you know, we arrived like hours <laughs> before, you know that, and so I, I I saw the drum set there, and I saw all the percussion, and of course I play both, but I said, "Well, since it's my percussion teacher who who gave me this, uh, called me on this, I said I must be doing the percussion part." Yeah. So I set up the whole thing and I, you know, put it all, laid it all out and I'm ready. And um, Anton Coppola, 
with the Mr. Little Toscanini that he was. <laughs> I, he just passed away not too long ago. He was 100 years old. Wow. And he was, he was amazing. He's the uncle of Francis Ford, right? Yeah. And uh, I looked at him, I introduced myself, and I said, I'm, I'm your percussionist. And I said, so who's playing the, the, drum, the drum part? He looked at me, he says, you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm quoting the voice too. He was such a funny guy. And then I started sweating. Yeah. I said, but I thought, I, no, you're, you're playing both. <laughs> so then I said, okay, now I figured out the doubles. It was not a mistake. <laughs> and I said, oh boy. And and then it was yeah. funny because then you know my name came up all the time because we had to stop to adjust. Okay, we, I don't don't do the xylophone here, play the timpani. I need the yeah. drum set there. With, so we had to do all the adjustments. So they had to stop for me all the time. So my yeah. my name became very famous, not the <laughs> wrong way, but you know like, right. But then Everybody all of a sudden, very quickly. <laughs> yes. So I got to be really famous with the actors. Right. With Fivish Finkel. Oh, so you're Aldo. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know the drill. And then I had to live with that. That, that it became an inside joke for them. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, Aldo, <laughs> one, one one other thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, you that's a really great point that you brought up and that not a lot of people know. And I didn't really understand it either. But when you play for Broadway shows, you can be asked to do all this crazy stuff. Because there aren't always, there isn't always enough room in a pit to have two percussionists, a drummer and a separate percussionist. So a lot of times you're asked to do everything. So you've got to know all those. You have to have <laughs> skills and technique on all those instruments and be able to juggle it all. That's a great point that you make that, you know, not a lot of people know when they're like, I'm going to play drums on Broadway. Well, can you play timpani? Can you play mouths? You got hand hand percussion, play some congas and stuff. You know, you got to have it all together. Sure, and and then and now it's. I mean, our world has been expanding in the percussion, right? So the the hand percussion, the the world, everything. So I don't know. You know, I to me, I, fortunately, I I love to play it all, and I just for me, it's like I I'm just a kid beginning still after all these years, and I still get more, and I'm learning more about certain instruments. The only thing I don't play is tabla because that would be like starting violin at this point. And I play so many other instruments that I like to go deep in. I said, yeah. I would never give it the justice that that needs. Right, right. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that it's expanding so much too. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, composers also, uh, the, the whole world is, has been expanding in that yeah. world. So any musician... And especially a drummer percussionist, where like if it's not a violin or a piano, it's a percussionist. Well, per drum piano is also a percussionist. But yeah. didgeridoo was a percussionist. I mean, we had to right. play those too. <laughs> yeah, when they can't find another place to put it, it gets thrown in the percussion. <laughs> yeah. So we should call it, you're not the percussionist, you're the everything man. Or the everything yeah. woman. <laughs> we used to call it a utility player. Because <laughs> you're doing everything, you know, and then we would joke about, well, you're playing on the wash bucket and the cash register as well. The kitchen sink, you know, we throw it all in. But yeah, it's it's a fun, it's it's a challenge and it makes it fun. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's how yeah. I see it. Yeah, there's no there's no end to that, which which is good. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, the day you arrive, well, you know, what does that look like? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Really you don't exactly. want to arrive. You want to, it's the voyage that's important. Right? <laughs> so yeah. true. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, I'm really happy to see that you're in this, uh, in this whole other world of production and, and exploring that and, and making things happen because basically uh, after a while you, you need to expand too. So that's, that's fantastic to, to hear. I was, I, when, when I got the news of that, it just put a smile on my face. I said, aha, now he's putting it out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been a slow, kind of a slow transition over the past decade or so. I, I gradually started contracting orchestras because I was always the person in the room with the rest of the creative team. And they said, oh, Larry, will you, you know, get us a bassist or get us another keyboard, or get us a couple guitar players or whatever. So I was there. And so I just started doing that. And because I knew everybody. All right, all right. You know, when you 
especially when you first start out subbing on Broadway shows. I mean, think about it. There are 41 Broadway theaters. If you're subbing at all these different shows and all these different orchestras, you meet that many more people than if you were just playing one show all the time. So I had amassed kind of this Rolodex of hundreds and hundreds of musicians that I knew and worked with at different in different ways. And so I kind of knew what their skill sets were. Like, oh, this this guitarist actually knows how to play dobro really well, or they could play pedal steel, or whatever, you know. So it was this natural evolution for me, contracting, and then I was conducting shows, which I loved as well. Then I went and started music supervising. I mean, it's just all been this gradual thing. And it's nice. always so much fun. I just feel so lucky. I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, and and more chapters. I mean, that's that's gonna be a big book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, Larry, I, I, I really want to thank you for uh for joining me today. And it, and it's been a while you've been on my mind. I said, I, I'll, I'll have to nail him down to, to talk about this because the whole Broadway thing is not, and not completely understood, but it's not just Broadway. It's about, you know, what path, what, what pulls you, right? I mean, you go to that place. It just speaks to you that pulls you. And you, you, eventually you, you end up, not just you land there, you end up in that environment and then you make your own variation of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's so true. Well, especially when I look back at everything, it's it's clear how every choice I made kind of led me to the next place that I yeah. ended up going. You know, it's all this big progression and follow just following what, what feels right in the moment. You know, all, going with it. I love that idea of that, you know. Yeah. It's but shaping. it's been a pleasure all though. Thank you so much. I'm glad. I'm glad we could nail this down and work it out. Yay. And well, that's called shaping your journey, Larry. You yes. did it. You do it. No, not you did it. You are doing it. <laughs> I want to thank you. And and as I always say, to be continued. <laughs>